Ilan, um, so following up on that uh, question, Karim, this is Usama here. Um, one question that I ask in terms of being a historian, so you've worked on 1948. You're right, we don't have the documentation now, but you know, I'm sure when the documents come out and the archives are released, we're going to, it'll be more shocking than, than, than we anticipated. But isn't there, don't you think there is a difference in terms of, we said global Palestine, global Israel, between 1948, when there really, when when the Palestinians were, there was no solidarity on a global scale with Pal. I mean, there was, there was a few states that were there were there was Islamic communities, of course, but there wasn't this level of consciousness. Uh, especially today, there's a level of consciousness about what happened in 1948, which obviously in 1948 people had no idea what was going to happen to them, and they were shocked. The Palestinians and the ethnic cleansing plan that you detail with such detail in your book. Was carried out um, and and effectively carried out and ethnically cleansed Palestine, but the Palestinians had no idea what was going to happen. Today, of course, they do, and people around the world have a much stronger sense. So, does that matter at one level? And the second question, following from what Karim was saying, is that in the Arab world and in the media of the Arab world, at least the media that is not um, that is not uh, hostile to to Palestinians. There is a sense that it's the U.S. that runs Israel, that this is an American operation rather than an Israeli operation. And to what extent is that just too simplistic or to what extent is that accurate? That, in other words, Israel is doing this because there is a U.S. plan to dominate the region. How do you how do you contextualize this in a wider frame? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me first go to, to 1948. I think. Uh, we all probably, I think, I'm, without asking you beforehand if, if you agree, we all have a very, let's say, a, a, a quite a negative view on the way the neighboring Arab states behaved in 1948. But I must say that uh, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I go back to that period as an historian, I do realize that and I'm quite serious in what I say, and as an historian, I cannot prove it, so I'm just putting here an assumption. Had the Arab armies not entered, or the troops, these were not proper armies, but there were, you know, a significant number of soldiers, okay? Had these significant numbers of soldiers not entered from Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria into historical Palestine, the number of Palestinian refugees would have been far, far uh, larger, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, probably uh, m most of the Palestinians would have found themselves outside of Palestine. Now, I'm not saying that this is the main reason why the uh, uh, some of the Arab states eventually dispatched their troops into Palestine, but it's important to understand that it it did it did what the Hezbollah didn't do. It it really uh, uh, forced. Uh, uh, the ethnic cleansing operation to be more limited than they were planned. Because the idea was really to empty the whole of Palestine from every Palestinian. Uh, this was definitely what, what was on the cards. Why, why do I say this? That, that these historical comparison needs to be a bit more complex to my mind. But you're absolutely right about the international community. And, and because the military effort by the Arab state was too late, and too little, the Israeli, we can call them now the Israelis because we are talking about what happened after the 15th of May, the Israelis were able to, to manage the two fronts, the front vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab armies, which more or less ended in August 1948, and do the, the most important bit of the ethnic cleansing in its last late stages in September and October up to the end of the year of 1948. So, so there is something there to, to, to think about. Uh, uh, even if these are not genuine solidarities, what happens if the region, neighboring countries uh, are doing something uh, in order to salvage uh, the Palestinians? But about the international community, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's a different setup. It's a different world. Uh, and uh, what I call global Palestine, namely this huge alliance uh, of people who see their own struggles for justice totally connected to the struggle for justice in Palestine is a powerful actor. It's a powerful uh, presence and, and, and it, it already has impact. It doesn't change yet the reality on the ground, but it has the potential to change the reality on the ground. Now, uh, for the question of, of the U.S., I think it's always, um, 
a bit difficult to distinguish between the if you want the tail and, and the dog here because um the israeli uh i think we seem to agree unless we'll see we'll see documentation uh, to uh, to contradict this we all agree that the israeli reaction was kind of billed as a response to the 7th of october i mean there is a conspiracy theory in israel going on that the performance of the israeli army was so dismal on the 7th of october that maybe they you know netanyahu wanted uh, and and by the way the intelligence in israel was so clear that the hamas is going to do it we, we now have so much intelligence coming out that shows that it's very difficult to believe that they didn't see the very clear uh, signs that this was going to happen right anyway but i i don't i still don't buy into this conspiracy until i will see something more solid i'm just mentioning it in brackets but because i th i do think that the op what the israeli operation uh, when we talk about the israeli operation it developed as a response rather than that the whole chess game was planned you know we want the hamas to attack and then we know what we're going to do i don't think we're there but let's let's keep an open mind about that as well um but uh let, let's say that this is right this is a reaction the american uh, game here uh, has uh, points of contact with the israeli strategy but the Israeli, first of all, the Israeli strategy is not a unified strategy. There are two very different basic Israeli orientations here among the policymakers. One of them is totally in accordance and in tandem with the American way of thinking. And one is troublesome for the Americans, almost a liability for the Americans. So we have to remember the composition of the political elite today in Israel that from there come, comes the group of policy makers that decide what to do tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. You have what you can call the kind of center-right Zionist uh, uh, parties or mindset, call it what you want. Um, most of them are ex-generals, ex-servicemen uh, uh, in the secret service, in, in the Mossad. These are, this is the group that tries to uh, they feel that they are taming Netanyahu and his allies on the extreme right. I think they work very closely with the Americans and uh, are willing, by the way, to, to play sometimes a symbolic game, hopefully sometimes it will be more meaningful game, in responding to American demands for more humanitarian aid, to maybe to end the direct military operations a bit earlier on, and at the same time, use the whole situation as a pretext to help America in its war against what a democratic party, which is crazy to say it when I hear myself saying it, that the democratic party is adopting a Republican discourse of an axis of evil that connects Russia, China, Iran, Hezbollah and Hamas into a, a, a new a, a alliance of evil. Uh, and therefore, situation like this enable you to, if not destroy this alliance, then to weaken it, to undermine it. Uh, and of course, by the, those actions, they actually create the alliance. The alliance isn't there, but America is creating the alliance uh, by its own uh, actions. And, and this is the worldview also of that group that I call them central right. The extreme right in Israel, which is very powerful and holds very strong position, Netanyahu pushed them out of what they call the war cabinet. That was the condition of those who joined, you know, from the opposition. So they're not in the war cabinet. So, so these lunatics and fanatics and fundamentalist Zionists are, are not in the cabinet uh, that decides of what to do tomorrow in Khan Yunis or in Gaza. But they are very important factor in the wider cabinet that will decide about the day after. And they would like to bring the settlers back to the Gaza Strip. They would like to use, and they're already pushing this with their settlers in the West Bank, to begin an ethnic cleansing of the West Bank to Jordan. Uh, and, and this is why they're putting pressure, and they already succeeded in at least doing the same thing in Gaza, but the world doesn't look at it. Uh, thousands of Palestinians were moved from the south of the West Bank to the north. Here the direction is different by the actions of the settlers when the army was stood by and allowed them to destroy villages in Masafir Aliata, the south of, of Mount Hebron. Uh, 
this is something that I think is a bit too much for the Americans. It's like, like you have these uh, uh, allies of yours that some of them are too, uh, too unreliable uh, and, and so on. So, so I think we have to look at these also balance, domestic Israeli balance of power. But all in all, all in all, this, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine said it's just unbelievable when you hear the American Secretary of State says, in moments like this, I'm a Jew. I mean, anti-Semites would jump on this. For 100 years, the American Jewish community was trying to convince the American public that there isn't such a thing as Jew loyalty, that American Jews are loyal to Israel. And then he says, no, in a moment like this, I'm not the Secretary of State of the United States, I'm the Secretary of State of the Jewish state. And then, and Biden kind of talks about his attachment, I don't know if you've seen his two last uh, uh, appearances, he talks about Israel like a basketball team, that he's, uh, you know, kind of admires and, and he has kind of a scratch in his heart for that and so on. It, it stupefies the American policymakers because I think that either it is the tail that wags the dog, namely it's, it's still a very powerful lobby that influences their policies, or they don't have the Democratic Party, unlike the, the neocons really don't have a clear vision of international relations. The more I'm thinking about it, that's my conclusion. I think that they, they have some sort of a domestic agenda in America, but they have not figured out to how do they build a counter narrative, counter, not narrative, how a counter worldview to the Republican one. Sometimes they act like Republicans or Republicans on steroids, and sometimes they, they, they counter it in talking, not so much in action. Uh, and we can see it in the Ukraine, we can see it in China, we can see it in India. Uh, 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 so this is something that uh, I think allows the Israelis this ability to uh, make sure that the U.S. is an ally that helps and, you know, talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk.